The C-7 is the principal small arms weapon of the Canadian forces. Its role is virtually universal as it's used throughout the range of conflict from nuclear war to peacekeeping and internal security. The initial stage of this lesson is on the characteristics and description of the C-7 rifle. First, we will cover the eight characteristics. It is a gas-operated, magazine-fed, air-cooled, semi-automatic or automatic weapon. It's capable of quick and accurate fire at short-range opportunity targets. It is capable of a high rate of accurate rapid fire at ranges up to 300 meters when used by an individual. It can provide effective section fire at ranges up to 600 meters. It can be fitted with a bayonet for close quarter fighting. The magazine holds 30 rounds. The rifle weighs 3.3 Ks and 3.8 Ks when fully loaded with a magazine. With its self-loading and fully automatic capability and 30-round magazine, a high standard of fire control is necessary to prevent wastage of ammunition. Now let's cover the description of the C7. The C7 rifle consists of the following major components. The upper receiver group and the lower receiver group. These components are locked together by a pivot pin located forward of the magazine opening and a takedown pin located immediately forward of the butt. Both locking pins are set in the lower receiver group. The upper receiver group comprises the upper receiver, the barrel, the bolt, and bolt carrier. The upper receiver is fixed to the barrel and houses the bolt, bolt carrier, and the cocking handle. A carrying handle, which incorporates the rear sight, is attached to the top of the upper receiver. The ejection port is situated on the right side of the upper receiver and is protected by a dust cover, which is opened by the forward or backward movement of the bolt. To the rear of the ejection port is a spent casing deflector for left-handed firers. A manually operated forward assist fitted on the right rear of the upper receiver is also used to push the bolt fully forward. The barrel is fitted with a flash suppressor. The barrel is surrounded by two interchangeable aluminum-lined, glass-fiber-filled nylon handguards, which are notched to allow air to circulate. The handguards also serve to protect the gas tube. The front sight assembly is fixed to the barrel. The bolt is operated by the cocking handle located at the top rear of the upper receiver group. The bolt has a rotating head, which locks into the barrel when the weapon is to be fired. The face of the bolt head is centrally holed to allow the firing pin to move forward to strike a chambered round. We will now move to the lower receiver group. The lower receiver contains the trigger mechanism, the pistol grip and magazine opening. A three position selector lever is located on the left side. S for safe, R for repetition, and auto for automatic. The selector lever cannot be placed on S until the weapon is cocked. A bolt catch located on the left side enables the bolt to be held open or released from the open position. A magazine release button is located on the right side. The butt is made of glass fiber reinforced nylon and incorporates a storage compartment for a cleaning kit. Access to this compartment is gained through the butt plate. The upper portion of the butt houses a buffer and a return spring. The butt is available in two lengths, normal and short. We are now ready for the second stage of the lesson, the safety precautions. On the order for inspection clear weapon, adopt the standing load position. Hold the rifle by the pistol grip, forefinger outside the trigger guard. Grasp the hand guard in an underhand grasp with the other hand. The left foot should be advanced one pace. The muzzle should be at an angle of about 1,000 mils. Grasp the cocking handle in an overhand grasp with the right hand and pull the action to the rear. Hold it there. Push in the bolt catch with the forefinger of the left hand. Push the cocking handle fully forward. Return the right hand to the pistol grip. Return the left hand to the handguard. Tilt the weapon to the left and inspect the chamber to ensure that it's clear. At night or in bad light conditions, feel with your fingers to ensure that the chamber is clear. Pull the cocking handle to the rear and allow the action to go forward under control. 
fire the action and close the ejection port cover. Step back with your left foot to the at ease position. Ground the rifle with the injection port up and the front sight in line with the toe of the right boot. Unfasten both pouches and remove the contents. Inspect all pouches, magazines, and dummy rounds to ensure that there are no live rounds present. Safety precautions are to be carried out before and after instruction, before stripping, during issue and return to stores, before and after range practices, when the safety status of the weapon is in doubt. The final stage of the lesson is on safe handling of the C7 rifle with no magazine fitted. When receiving a rifle from another soldier or on picking up a rifle, point the muzzle in a safe direction and carry out the following actions. Pull the cocking handle to the rear and hold it there. Check and ensure that the chamber is clear. Allow the action to go forward under control and fire the action, close the ejection port cover. Never point the rifle at anyone in jest. It is extremely important that each soldier knows the capabilities and components of the C7 rifle. Remember to handle the C7 safely at all times. In the first stage of this lesson, we will cover field stripping, which is carried out for daily cleaning. In order to clean and maintain the C7 rifle properly, the soldier must know how to strip and assemble the weapon properly. First, carry out safety precautions. Do not operate the trigger. Next, ensure the selector is set at S. Push and pull the takedown pin to the right. Pivot the upper receiver group upwards. Pull the cocking handle partially to the rear and pull the bolt carrier group out of the upper receiver. Push the cocking handle fully forward. Remove the retaining pin from the bolt carrier. Slide the firing pin out of the rear of the bolt carrier. Rotate the bolt until the cam pin is clear of the bolt carrier key. Rotate the cam pin one quarter turn and remove it from the bolt carrier. Pull the bolt out of bolt carrier. Do not strip the bolt. Next, we will strip the magazine. Insert a pointed object into the indent and lift the base plate off. Pull out and separate the spring and platform. This completes field stripping. To assemble the weapon, it is done in the reverse order. Assemble the magazine spring and platform. Insert spring and platform into magazine opening and compress spring and engage the notch of the base plate into the indent in the side of the magazine. Next, assemble the bolt and bolt carrier. When placing the bolt into the bolt carrier, ensure that the cam pin hole with the indentations is at the bottom. Insert bolt into bolt carrier. Insert cam pin and rotate one quarter turn, locking bolt to the carrier key. Insert firing pin into the rear of the bolt carrier. Slide firing pin fully forward. Insert retaining pin into the left side of the bolt carrier and ensure it is flush with the carrier. Ensure that the bolt is fully forward in the bolt carrier prior to placing the bolt into the upper receiver by pulling the bolt fully forward. Pull the cocking handle partially to the rear. Insert the bolt carrier into the upper receiver so the bolt key is properly aligned 
and slide the bolt carrier forward. Push cocking handle fully forward. Ensure the selector lever is at S. If the selector lever is at automatic, the automatic sear will interfere with the bolt carrier when the upper receiver is closed down upon the lower receiver. Close the upper receiver by pushing down and engage the takedown pin until it is fully seated. Once the weapon has been assembled, it must be checked to ensure that it has been correctly assembled and is operating. This procedure is known as the function test. Cock the weapon. With the selector lever at S, attempt to fire the rifle. It should not fire. Set the selector lever at R. Squeeze the trigger, firing the action. While holding the trigger back, cock the action and release the trigger. The hammer should be felt and heard, falling from the disconnector, then be caught immediately by the trigger sear. Squeeze the trigger. The action should fire. Set the selector lever to auto. Cock the rifle. The hammer should be held by the automatic sear. Squeeze the trigger, firing the action. While holding the trigger to the rear, cock the action. As the bolt carrier moves fully forward, the hammer should fall to strike the firing pin. Release the trigger. Set the selector lever to R. Close the ejection port cover. The function test must be completed after assembly to ensure that the C7 has been correctly assembled and is in operating order. Now you have seen how to field strip your weapon. In the next stage, we will take you one step further. That is detailed stripping. This is carried out so the user can do comprehensive cleaning after firing the weapon. The first part to be stripped in detailed stripping is the bolt. Pressing down slightly on the extractor, use a sharp object to push the extractor retaining pin out from the bolt. Lift the extractor and extractor pin from the bolt. Do not separate the extractor spring from the extractor. The ejector will not be stripped from the bolt. Remove the handguards from the upper receiver assembly. By pulling the handguard slip ring towards the upper receiver, then lift each handguard away from the handguard cap and put them down. Next, push and pull the receiver pivot pin at the front of the magazine housing and separate the upper receiver from the lower receiver. Remove the cocking handle from the upper receiver by pulling the cocking handle to the rear and pressing down on it. Pick up the lower receiver group and depress the buffer retaining pin slightly. Slowly ease the buffer and return spring forward until they are clear of the buffer retaining pin. It may be necessary to depress the hammer to allow the buffer and return spring to clear the hammer as they are pulled out of the butt and receiver extension assembly. Separate the buffer and the return spring. Set the selector lever to R. Controlling the hammer, fire the action. No further stripping will be done by the rifleman. To assemble the rifle, it is done in the reverse order. First, pick up the buffer and return spring and assemble them. Next, pick up the lower receiver group. Depress the hammer to the cocked position. Insert the return spring and buffer into the recess in the butt and compress the spring. Make sure that the buffer makes contact with the retaining pin by giving a slight twist on the buffer. Next, pick up the upper receiver and the cocking handle. Insert the cocking handle guide ribs into the recess in the upper receiver and push the cocking handle fully forward. Now pick up the lower receiver group and attach it to the upper receiver group by pushing the pivot pin at the front of the magazine housing into place. Next is the handguards. To replace the handguards, pull the handguard slip ring towards the upper receiver. Then place each handguard in the handguard cap and release the slip ring. Ensure that both handguards are seated. 
Lay the rifle down and pick up the bolt and extractor. Place the extractor into the groove and by pressing down with your thumb, line up all holes and replace the extractor retaining pin. The weapon is now in the field strip state. Regular maintenance of the rifle by cleaning and inspection is essential and is to be carried out on a regular basis as required, before firing, and after firing. A cleaning kit is provided with the C7. The kit is contained in a case in the butt of the weapon. It consists of the following parts. The case, a four-piece rod, a swab holder, a bore brush, a chamber brush, a bolt key brush, a container of cleaner lubricant preservative, pipe cleaner, and swabs. The maintenance concept is to use cleaner lubricant preservative, or CLP, for all temperatures and conditions. No other oil, solvent, or lubricant is to be used. The CLP must be shaken vigorously before use to ensure that the Teflon particles are returned to suspension. When correctly mixed, the solution should have a milky look. CLP must be applied in very limited amounts, as too much will cause stoppages. Even when wiped dry, the lubricant is still at work on the weapon. Regular cleaning of the weapon consists of cleaning the chamber, which is cleaned with the chamber brush fitted to the cleaning rod handle. The flash suppressor, clean using bore cleaning brush. The barrel. The four-piece rod, bore brush, and swab holder are required. Attach three rod sections together, but leave each about two turns short of being tight. Attach the swab holder, leaving it two turns short of tight also. Place a swab moistened with CLP in the swab holder. Point the muzzle down. Insert the end of the rod without the swab holder into the chamber. Let the rod fall straight through the bore. About 50 to 75 millimeters will stick out of the muzzle. Pull the rod through the bore and out of the muzzle. The rod will twist tight as pulled through. Replace the swab holder with the bore brush and repeat the drill. The handle will have to be placed on the rod to pull it through. Repeat this action several times. The rods will have to be loosened after two or three repetitions. Pull through a dry swab. Pull through a swab lightly lubricated with CLP. The bolt and carrier. Clean the interior of the bolt key with the bolt key brush. Dry using a pipe cleaner. Ensure the entire interior is cleaned and dried. Using a CLP lubricated swab, clean the outer and inner surfaces of the bolt. Firing pin recess and firing pin. Firing pin hole. Use a pipe cleaner. Locking lugs. The area behind the bolt ring and under the lip of the extractor. 
Clean the ejector by holding the bolt ejector down, extractor up. Place a few drops of CLP around the ejector. Place a dummy round or empty casing under the lip of the extractor and rock it back and forward, compressing the ejector. Repeat several times until the ejector moves in and out smoothly. Wipe off excess CLP. Lubricate the bolt and carrier. Apply CLP lightly to the firing pin and firing pin recess in the bolt. Apply CLP generously to the bolt exterior, particularly the cam pin area and bolt rings. Apply CLP lightly on the extractor and pin. Apply CLP lightly to the charging handle and inner and outer bolt carrier surfaces. Apply CLP generously on the slide and cam pin area. Dry the bolt key and place one drop of CLP inside the tube. The upper receiver. Clean the external surface with a CLP lubricated swab and the nylon cleaning brush from the section cleaning kit. Wipe dry. Clean the exterior of the gas tube which protrudes into the upper receiver using two rod pieces and a bore brush. Use a pipe cleaner to clean as far into the gas tube as possible. Clean the inner surfaces of the upper receiver. Lightly lubricate the inside of the upper receiver, outer surface of the barrel, front sight, and the surface under the handguard. Depress the front sight detent and apply two or three drops of CLP to it. Depress it several times to work the lubricant into the spring. Lightly lubricate the locking lugs in the chamber entrance. Caution: Do not use abrasive material or wire brushes on the aluminum surfaces. The lower receiver. Clean the external surface with a CLP lubricated swab and the nylon cleaning brush from the section cleaning kit. Wipe dry. Clean the interior, paying particular attention to the magazine housing and trigger group. Caution, do not strip the trigger group. Clean the drain hole and the butt using a pipe cleaner. Clean the inside of the buffer tube using the rod and swab holder. Wipe the buffer and spring. Lightly lubricate the buffer and spring and inside the buffer tube. Apply CLP generously to the trigger group, takedown pin, and pivot pin. The butt and hand guards. Clean external surfaces. Do not oil nylon surfaces. The magazine. Wipe with a dry swab. Lightly lubricate the spring. Do not oil the body or magazine platform. The bayonet and scabbard. Clean and lightly lubricate metal parts. This completes the regular cleaning of the C7 rifle. It is essential that the soldier be capable of maintaining their rifle in a state of readiness under battle conditions and aware of the need for safe handling. All ammunition is rimless. Its caliber is 5.56 millimeters, and this together with manufacturing information is stamped on the base of each cartridge. Ammunition is normally issued in bandoliers containing a magazine charger and 100 rounds in 10 round clips. There are four natures of ammunition issued. Ball, or C-77, has a smooth brass cartridge case, a jacketed bullet, and a percussion cap in the base. Tracer C-78 is similar to Ball, but the top of the bullet is painted red. Blank rounds have a smooth brass cartridge case, crimped nose, and a percussion cap in the base. Dummy or training rounds are silver-colored one-piece rounds with no percussion cap. In an emergency, manufactured Armalite ammunition, 
Ball M193 and Tracer M196 can be fired. Ammunition must be cared for if it is to function properly. Always keep ammunition clean, dry, and free from oil. Never let ammunition lie in the direct rays of the sun as the absorbed heat can cause inaccuracies when firing. Tampering with ammunition is dangerous and forbidden. Avoid using a round as a tool. However, if it is unavoidable, do not attempt to fire any round used in this way. Do not apply pressure to the base of the round, either with a clip or another round. There is a possibility of detonating the percussion cap and thereby firing the round. Magazines are to be inspected regularly. Damaged magazines will cause stoppages. The magazine issued with the C7 rifle will hold 30 rounds. When on operations, always completely fill the magazine. During training, put in the number and types of rounds ordered. Before filling any magazine, inspect it for signs of damage, particularly in the area of the guide lips. There are two methods of filling magazines, by using the magazine charger and by hand. The fastest method is the charger. After inspecting the magazine, grip it in the left hand and position it on a firm surface. Ensure the back of the magazine is facing away from the body. Fit the charger onto the magazine and ensure it is fully seated. Place a clip of 10 rounds into the charger. With the right thumb on the top round, push down until all the rounds are fed into the magazine. Remove and discard the clip. Each time a clip is fed into the magazine, ensure the base of the last round is fully up against the rear wall of the magazine. Fill all magazines and then place the charger in a pouch. The second method is to fill the magazine with loose rounds by hand. Hold the magazine in the same manner used with the charger. Push the rounds into the magazine one by one. Make sure the base of each round is against the magazine rear wall. At times it may be necessary to remove the rounds from a magazine. Using an empty clip, press down on each second round, thus allowing the top round to fall out. Ensure the rounds do not fall in the dirt. An alternate method is to hold the magazine in the left hand, bullets pointing away from the body. Push the base of the round forward so that it disengages from the guide lips. It may be necessary to twist and pull the round clear. The next stage in this lesson is the weapon sights. The front sight consists of a square post with two protectors on either side of it. The rear sight consists of a flip-type leaf sight set in the top of the carrying handle. There are two apertures, which are changed by pushing the leaf forward or backward. The small aperture is used at all times, except during close quarter battle operations, at night or in low light conditions. The C7 rifle is considered loaded when it has a magazine on it. On the order load, adopt the standing load position. Hold the rifle by the pistol grip and place your forefinger outside the trigger. Keep the muzzle pointed upwards. Unfasten the ammunition pouch and take out a loaded magazine. Check that the top rounds are positioned correctly and push the magazine firmly into the magazine housing. Make certain that it is secure, but do not hit the magazine. Secure the ammunition pouch. On the order ready, or on a range being ordered, check the weapon sights for correct setting. Cock the rifle and ensure the bolt carrier moves fully forward. Do not ride the cocking handle. Strike the forward assist assembly and close the ejection port. Set the selector lever to S. On the order unload, set the selector lever to S and undo your magazine pouch. Remove the magazine and place it in the pouch. Point the muzzle upwards. Tilt the rifle to the right and pull the cocking handle to the rear twice. 
hold the cocking handle to the rear. Tilt the rifle to the left and look or feel that the chamber is empty. Let the cocking handle go forward. Set the selector lever to R and squeeze the trigger. Close the ejection port cover. Recover the ejected round. Clean and replace it in the magazine. Put the magazine in the pouch and do up the pouch. When the command make safe is given, carry out the following drills. Do a complete unload. Then, load the weapon. Do not cock the action. On completion of the drill make safe, your weapon will have the magazine fit it, but no round will be in the chamber. Once ordered to load the rifle, the soldier is responsible for keeping it loaded until ordered to unload. Each firer is responsible for the safe handling of their rifle and must ensure that when the weapon is ready to fire, the selector lever is always at S unless a fire order has been given. When a soldier is no longer able to ensure its safe handling, when it is handed over to another person or left under guard while he or she is performing some duty, the rifle is always unloaded. On a firing range, the muzzle is always pointed at the sky, at the ground, or in the direction of the target. If an unattended rifle is picked up with a magazine fitted, it is to be unloaded immediately. Always treat your rifle as if it were loaded and never pointed at anyone in jest. The rifle is considered loaded when it has a magazine fitted. It is prepared to fire when the sight is set. It is cocked and a live round is in the chamber. The rifle is only unloaded when it has no magazine on and no round in the chamber. The rifle will normally be loaded in the standing position and the soldier will subsequently adopt any firing position which may be ordered. Once ordered to load the rifle, the soldier is responsible for the safe handling of the weapon with the magazine fitted. Five round application, turn it to your front, your own time, fire. It is essential that the soldier is capable of firing the rifle accurately and instinctively under battle conditions. This can be achieved if they understand and apply the following marksmanship principles. The position and hold must be firm enough to support the rifle. The rifle must point naturally at the target without any physical effort. Sight alignment must be correct. The shot must be released and followed through without disturbing the position. The firer must employ these principles every time the rifle is fired. The basic shooting position is the prone position, since it gives the firer the best support and presents a small target to the enemy and is the least tiring. To properly adopt the prone position, the following action takes place. On the command down, advance the left foot. Hold the rifle in front of the body with the left hand around the handguard. Lie down by breaking the fall with the right hand. The flash suppressor must be kept clear of the ground. The body should be relaxed and form an angle of 200 mils with the line of fire. The left leg lies parallel to the direction of the body with the toes turned inward and the leg muscles relaxed. The right leg is drawn up until the thigh is approximately 1600 mils to the line of the body and the lower part of the leg lies parallel to the line of fire. The right foot points outwards with the heel on the ground. By drawing up the right leg, the weight of the body is rolled to the left, 
thus allowing easier breathing and less restriction to the heart, which in turn reduces pulse beat. The fire is to adjust the position of the right leg according to build. The rifle is supported by the left hand holding the handguard and the right hand firmly gripping the pistol grip. The index finger lies outside the trigger guard. If discomfort or difficulty is experienced in adopting the standard prone position, lie slightly oblique to the line of fire with the legs apart. To stand up, place the right hand on the ground. Draw the left hand holding the rifle to the rear. Stand up, readopt the standing position. Holding in the prone position. Once the range is given, the firer takes the following action. Raise the large aperture. Position the selector lever to R. Lift the rifle and place the butt in the shoulder. Left hand should be as far forward on the handguard as is practicable. The left elbow is brought as close to the rifle as possible without exerting lateral pressure against the magazine. The weight of the rifle is supported by the rear outside of the elbow joint, thus achieving bone support. The handguard should lie diagonally across the palm of the left hand. No attempt should be made to either grip tightly or pull backward with the left hand. It should simply support the rifle and maintain steadiness. The position of the butt in the shoulder should not be too high. If it rests on the collarbone, some pain may be felt on firing, causing a tendency to flinch. The right hand is the controlling hand and must hold the pistol grip firmly. The right elbow must then be positioned and must not alter the position of the weapon. The grip with the right hand must be unstrained and must pull the rifle back towards a firm shoulder. No attempt should be made to hunch the shoulder towards the butt plate. The cheek and not the cheekbone must be positioned naturally on the butt, allowing the aiming eye to look squarely through the sight. The head must be upright. Testing and adjusting the position. It is essential that the rifle points naturally at the target. To ensure that it does, the firer is to test and, if necessary, adjust his position as follows. Aim at the target, then relax the hold. No appreciable change of aim should be noticed. If the aim does move by an appreciable amount, it is an indication that the position needs some adjustment. To adjust the position, keep the left elbow stationary and pivot the body to the right or left as needed to correct lateral errors. For errors in elevation, keep both elbows stationary and move the rest of the body forwards or backwards. To confirm that the position is correctly adjusted, rest the rifle and close the eyes and bring the rifle back to a comfortable position in the shoulder. When the eyes are opened, the aim picture should be on or very close to the aiming mark. With practice, it will become natural to adopt a position that requires little or no adjustment. Aiming. Aim at the lowest central point of the aiming mark on a target with an aiming patch. Aim at the middle of a man or of a figure target. At ranges in excess of 300 meters, aim high. Aiming can never be instinctive. It requires concentration to achieve sight alignment together with correct aim picture, which is a four-point relationship between the eye, the center of the aperture, the tip of the foresight, and the point of aim. The procedure for aiming is as follows. Close the eye not in use. Look through the center of the aperture and centralize the tip of the foresight. Select a point of aim 
and focus the tip of the foresight and place it on the point of aim to complete the aim picture. It should be noted that the aiming mark will be slightly blurred. Check that the sights are upright and that the tip of the foresight is still central in the aperture. Eye relief is the distance from the eye to the rear aperture and must remain constant for successive shots. By ensuring this, the apparent size of the aperture remains the same and centralization of the foresight tip is simplified. It is essential that the soldier be capable of firing their rifles accurately and instinctively under battle conditions. This can only be achieved if the marksmanship principles are followed and that accurate aiming, alignment of sights, and firm, correct holding, especially with the right hand, are practiced and mastered. In this video, you will learn firing in the prone position, how to hold the rifle correctly in the prone position, testing and adjusting the position, and correct aim. Ensure weapon sights are in good condition. One of the principles of marksmanship is that the shot is to be released and followed through without disturbing the firing position. This stage deals with the technique required to do this and combines all four marksmanship principles in the prone position, which are the position and hold must be firm enough to support the rifle. The rifle must point naturally at the target without any physical effort. Sight alignment must be correct. And the shot must be released and followed through without disturbing the position. A shot should be fired without disturbing the aim. If the soldier is firing from a stable position with the rifle held firmly and pointing naturally at the target, all that is required is control of breathing and a smooth trigger operation to prevent undue movement of the weapon. Breathing is a natural function which will continue without strain until an individual does something to disturb the cycle. It is important, therefore, that firers restrain their breathing in a way which induces no strain. To achieve this, take two deep breaths to oxygenate the body. Slightly extend the natural pause between breathing out and in. And release the shot within six seconds. During the breathing pause, it is necessary to perfect the aim as near as possible and squeeze the trigger without disturbing the aim. Trigger slack should be taken up just before restraining the breath and perfecting the aim. It is important that the squeezing action of the trigger finger is achieved without moving or reducing the grip of the right hand. Operation of the trigger does not complete the sequence of firing the shot. Follow through of the shot is intended to eliminate any movement of the rifle caused by the fire relaxing or raising his head before the bullet has left the muzzle. The fire must try to remain on aim, watching the sights and maintaining the firing position for about two seconds after operating the trigger. As the shot is fired, the recoil action causes the muzzle of the rifle to move, usually in an upward direction. This movement should be consistent for successive shots. After each shot, the firer must watch for movement of the sights during the follow-through and immediately declare the shot correct or incorrect to the coach. After an incorrect declaration when live firing, the firer and the coach should discuss the fault and its correction. Automatic fire may be employed using the same marksmanship principles. When the order to fire bursts is given, move the selector lever to A. When the aim and hold are correct, the trigger should be pressed long enough to fire a burst of two to three rounds and then released. Bursts of more than three rounds are liable to be inaccurate as the weapon has a tendency to fire high after the first shot. 
A strong grip with the forward hand can counteract this. It is essential that the rifle points naturally at the target. To ensure that it does, the firer must test and, if necessary, adjust his position. Once the firing position is stable, restraining the breathing for a few seconds after oxygenating the body with two deep breaths, coupled with smooth trigger manipulation, should allow the bullet to leave the muzzle without any undue movement of the weapon. Remember to follow through on your shot and declare your shot, especially when on a live fire range with a coach. As a member of the Canadian Forces, you will be required to produce different types of fire on order from a range officer, or from your section commander, or on your own initiative. You must be familiar with these types of fire and know when to use them in order to apply effective fire with a minimum waste of time and ammunition. In battle, a rifleman usually carries his first line ammunition, which consists of five full magazines, one on the weapon, and four in the pouches. Under operational conditions, the rifleman is also issued with a bandolier containing 100 rounds, which is worn slung over other equipment. It is used to refill the magazines during lull in battle. Some soldiers may also carry tracer ammunition for target indication. Conservation of ammunition must be kept in mind. The high rates of fire that are possible must be strictly controlled to prevent ammunition supply problems. Ammunition expenditure can be controlled by a section commander by calling for various types of fire. One type is deliberate fire, which is a slow rate of fire, not normally more than five rounds per minute. When a target has been indicated, put the selector lever to R. Aim, test and adjust your position as necessary. On the command, fire, control your breathing, perfect the aim, fire, and follow through. Lower the muzzle and observe the target area. Continue to fire at deliberate rate. Keep count of the number of rounds fired. Change magazines when necessary. Snap shooting is firing at targets which show themselves for short periods of time. It is similar to deliberate shooting, except that the soldier works faster to reduce the interval between shots, usually firing two shots during the one breath restraint. The alert position is adopted on the command watch and shoot, and is a good position to adopt when expecting the enemy to appear. It is an easy position to maintain while the soldier is observing his arc of fire. To adopt the alert position, push the selector to R, Bring the butt into the shoulder with the muzzle pointing downwards and watch the target area. Firing a number of quick shots in succession is called rapid fire. It is similar to snap shooting, except that the soldier may fire more rounds. With practice, the soldier will be able to fire 20 or more accurate shots at different targets in a minute. When automatic fire is required, the order will be bursts, rapid fire. On hearing bursts, the selector lever is set to auto on fire. Fire as quickly as possible in bursts of two to three rounds while maintaining accuracy. To allow the chamber to cool during lulls and rapid fire, cock the rifle, engage the bolt catch, and open the ejection port cover. If time permits, replace the round in the magazine. To get ready to fire again, release the bolt catch. It is important to apply the sequence of firing a shot for all types of firing. Proper breathing, trigger manipulation, and follow-through techniques are key points in improving marksmanship. All of the positions in this lesson are less stable than the prone position, and it's impossible to hold the rifle perfectly still when aiming. An area aim on target as opposed to a point of aim has to be accepted. The size of the area aim will depend on the stability of the position being used and the time available for the shot. 
This area will decrease in size with practice as the soldier's shooting muscles develop and reflex actions speed up. When deployed under operational conditions or on a field firing range, it's often impossible to engage targets from the prone position. The soldier must learn to adopt either the kneeling, sitting, squatting, or standing position according to the nature of the ground and the target. With practice, it's possible to make an immediate decision as to which is the most suitable in each instance. Whatever the position adopted, the actions on receiving the order ready are the same as for the prone position. The kneeling position can be adopted quickly and easily, particularly when advancing. It's convenient when using low cover. It provides reasonable stability and can be maintained for lengthy periods without undue discomfort. Face half right to the line of fire. Kneel on the right knee. Keeping it well out to the right and, if possible, sit on the heel or the side of the foot. Rest the left forearm behind or in front of the left knee and the butt on the right thigh. This is known as the rest position. On a range being ordered, set the sight, cock the weapon, and put the selector lever on S. On the command watch and shoot, adopt the alert position. Bring the butt into the shoulder and move the selector lever to R. The left foot is turned inwards to lock the lower part of the foot and reduce movement. The left knee is under the rifle and the butt is higher in the shoulder than in the prone position. The weight of the body is taken over the right heel. The sitting position is useful when firing from a forward slope, in low scrub, in a night ambush, or at moving targets at short ranges. Sit with the legs crossed or apart and place the feet in a comfortable position. The rifle is held as in the kneeling position. On a range being ordered, set the sight, cock the weapon, and put the selector lever on S. On the command, watch and shoot, adopt the alert position. Bring the butt into the shoulder and move the selector lever to R. Place the elbows in front of or on the inside of the knees. The standing position is used primarily when firing from behind high cover, in a trench, or during an advance to contact when targets are engaged quickly. Adopt the standing load position. On a range being ordered, set the sight, cock the weapon, and put the selector lever on S. On the command watch and shoot, adopt the alert position. Bring the butt into the shoulder and move the selector lever to R, muzzle pointing forward and down. The handguard is held and the body leans slightly forward in the direction of the target. The squatting position is useful for firing from mud, shallow water, and in open country where other firing positions may not easily be adopted. Some difficulty may be experienced in adopting the position, but continued practice will enable the firer to adopt the position to suit his build. To use the squatting position, halt with the feet 100 to 400 millimeters apart and drop down onto the haunches into a natural squatting position. The body is to be about 535 mils, or 30 degrees, to the line of fire. The left foot may point at the target. The backs of the thigh rest against the backs of the calf. Allow the knee to bend to their full extent. Any tension in the thighs will cause undue strain to the calf muscles. Adjustments for direction onto the target are quickly and easily achieved by moving the right foot either to the left front or the right rear. Muscle relaxation in the legs is most important in this position 
and experimentation may be necessary to suit the individual firer. Adjustment of the position could entail raising the right or both heels slightly from the ground, ensuring the weight is evenly distributed on the balls of the feet. Some firers may prefer the inside of the right foot to be flat on the ground. No matter which position is adopted in relation to available cover, the four marksmanship principles are to be applied. Remember, a change of firing position can affect accuracy. is useful only if it's operational. To better ensure that your weapon is capable of carrying out its purpose, it's necessary for you, the firer, to understand how the rifle works and why stoppages occur. In this way, you'll be better equipped to remedy stoppages and get the rifle firing again as soon as possible. If the rifle fails to fire or stops firing, the immediate action is to cant the rifle to the left and look in the injection port at the position of the bolt. If the bolt is at the rear, check for an empty magazine and change magazines. Operate the bolt catch and strike the forward assist assembly and re-aim and continue firing. If the bolt is fully forward, Physically check the magazine to ensure it's fully seated and locked in place. Cock the rifle and watch for the ejection of a round or empty casing. If a round or empty casing is ejected, strike the forward assist assembly. Re-aim and carry on firing. If no empty case or round is ejected, attempt to continue firing. If the rifle fails to fire, further action must be taken. If the bolt carrier is partially forward, cock the weapon and push in the bolt catch. Examine the body and chamber of the weapon. If a live round or empty case is in the body or chamber, remove the magazine. Clear the obstruction. Replace the magazine. Operate the bolt catch and strike the forward assist. Re-aim and continue firing. And if the body and chamber are clear, operate the bolt catch. Strike the forward assist. Re-aim. Continue firing. If an obstruction in the chamber cannot be removed during the initial remedial action, or the chamber is being repeatedly obstructed, or the weapon is hard to cock, or will not fire after carrying out initial remedial action, unload the weapon, remove the takedown pin, and remove the bolt carrier and bolt. Examine the extractor. Ejector tests the firing pin protrusion. And if any faults are found, engage a weapons technician to remedy them. If the chamber does not appear to be obstructed and there are no broken parts, examine it for a separated case. If one is found, consult the weapons technician. It is essential that the gas receiver and the rear of the gas tube are cleaned regularly. If this is not done, there is a possibility that these two parts may become fused together with a round in the chamber. This will mean either that the weapon will not cock after firing the first round, or that the round in the chamber cannot be unloaded by cocking. As soon as possible, strip the rifle and clean the gas-affected parts. Regular care and maintenance play a vital role in keeping his weapon operational.
In battle or during range work, the strength and direction of the wind have a direct influence on the flight of the bullet. It is essential that the soldier make allowances to counter this influence and ensure a first round hit. It is also important to know how to react should the shot miss the target. Figure 11 targets are 1145 millimeters or 45 inches high and 450 millimeters or 18 inches wide. Figure 12 targets are 570 millimeters or 22 inches high and 450 millimeters, 18 inches wide. It is important that the firer know the dimensions of the figure 11 target. The center of the visible mass, the crotch area, is normally the area selected as the point of aim. There are three areas above the point of aim which can be used to adjust fire. The hand at 150 millimeters, or 6 inches, the chin at 300 millimeters, or 12 inches, and the rim of the helmet at 450 millimeters or 18 inches. Below the point of aim are another three reference points. The crotch at 150 millimeters or 6 inches, the knee at 300 millimeters or 12 inches, and the ankle at 450 millimeters or 18 inches. Knowing these dimensions on a figure 11 target is an aid when altering points of aim at longer ranges. Errors in elevation and direction can be overcome by changing the point of aim. If from the point of aim the shot is seen to be high, 300 millimeters, and to the left, 100 millimeters, re-aim low, 300 millimeters, and right, 100 millimeters of the original point of aim. Only a wind blowing across the front will make a bullet veer considerably from its flight path. To allow for this, aim off into the wind. The direction of the wind can be determined by its effect on the face, trees, dust, or smoke. The amount to aim off is determined by the strength of the wind. For ranges of 100 meters or less, no aim off is required. In windy conditions at ranges greater than 100 meters, the following points of aim relative to a figure 11 target should be used. A fresh wind, 10 kilometers per hour, would cause range flags to stand about halfway out from the pole. To adjust your aim, select a point of aim halfway between the center and the edge of the target at 200 meters and at the edge of the target at 300 meters. A strong wind of 20 kilometers per hour would cause range flags to strain away from their poles. The adjusted point of aim for this condition would be the edge of the target at 200 meters and one target width from the center of the target at 300 meters in the event of continually missing the target. Increase the aim off to the edge of the target and fire. If still a miss, aim and fire at the base of the target and adjust the point of aim from the observation of the strike. Wind is a variable factor which can affect the mean point of impact of your rounds. Knowing proper drills for the various wind conditions as well as what to do in the case of a miss will give you more confidence when firing your weapon, as well as increase the probability of a first round hit. In this video, you will be shown methods of carrying the rifle and how to fire at close quarters. When moving in close country, on patrol, or in a built-up area, the enemy may fire and attack at close quarters. In such situations, it is the quickness and accuracy of the first shots which gain success. The soldier is, therefore, to carry his rifle in a ready state and in a manner best suited to the type of terrain over which he is moving. The high port, alert, and low port are firing positions which can be maintained for extended periods. The cradle carry provides a semi-alert position which can be maintained for longer periods as the butt of the weapon is supported on the forearm. The delay in bringing the weapon into aim from this position is only fractionally longer than from the alert position. As the butt is placed outside the elbow, 
It enables the soldier wearing a fragmentation vest to bring the weapon directly to the shoulder without extending the arms to avoid the configuration of the vest. The position of high port is used when going through scrub or when crossing obstacles. If the soldier stumbles using this position, the muzzle of the rifle will not get entangled, become filled with dirt, or point at his comrades. To assume the position of high port, bring the rifle up across the body, left hand on the handguard, right hand around the pistol grip and barrel pointing upwards. Move the selector to S and place the finger outside the trigger guard. The alert position is adopted when expecting the enemy to appear and is an easy position to maintain while the soldier is observing his arc of fire. To adopt the alert position, push the selector lever to R. Bring the butt of the rifle into the shoulder with the muzzle pointing downwards. Each soldier is responsible for the safe handling of his rifle and is to move the selector lever to S when necessary. The low port position is used when the tactical situation does not necessitate the use of the high port or alert positions, and in particular, on internal security operations when one hand is required for searching personnel, checking documents, or moving barriers. Hold the rifle by the pistol grip, finger outside the trigger guard, selector lever at S, with the barrel pointing upwards and the heel of the butt resting on the waist. When a soldier is on the move, either in an advance or on a patrol, he must be prepared to fire from a variety of positions. He may move his selector lever to R or A in anticipation of the rate of fire to be utilized. If hand-to-hand -hand combat is anticipated, bayonets may be fixed to the rifle. It should be remembered that accuracy is affected when firing with the bayonet fixed and that it's necessary to aim slightly low at close range targets. Once the enemy has been located, the ideal is to hit with the first shot. Two or more shots in rapid succession or double taps will improve the chances of a kill. Having fired, the soldier will immediately take evasive action and go to cover to continue the engagement. Remember, firing bursts will cause the weapon to fire higher than normal after the first shot. If a soldier has to remedy a stoppage or change magazines, this should be done from behind cover. Ensure you check your ammunition before continuing the advance. The method of carrying the rifle will be dependent on the situation and the terrain. A soldier must be able to bring his weapon into action quickly and accurately and make the best use of available cover to ensure survivability and success. Most shots fired under operational conditions will be against moving targets and most frequently from the standing or kneeling position when in close country or urban areas and during the advance and attack. It is important that soldiers know what allowances to make for target movement and the techniques used to apply them in any firing position. Frequent practice is required to achieve and maintain a high degree of skill in engaging moving targets. When a shot is fired at a moving target, the target continues to move during the time of flight of the bullet. To allow for this movement, it is necessary to aim in front of the target, otherwise shots will fall behind it. This aiming in front to anticipate the movement of a target is known as lead. The amount of lead necessary will depend upon the speed, range, and direction of movement. A running man will require more lead than a man walking. A target moving obliquely across the front will require less lead than a direct crossing target. And a target advancing head-on or moving away from the firer requires no lead at all. The further the target is away, 
the greater is the lead required to allow for its movement. Soldiers must acquire the feel for the correct lead necessary to hit moving targets under varying conditions, and this proficiency will only be achieved by frequent practice. A moving target can only be effectively engaged when the correct lead or point of aim has been taken. There are two methods of engaging moving targets. The basic method and the ambush. With the basic method, the firer comes into the aim behind the target and swings through the target to the leading edge. Without checking the swing, open fire and if necessary, increase the lead while firing a series of shots. Continue to fire until the target is hit or goes to the ground. If it is difficult to swing with the target, as from a prone or sitting position where both elbows are rested, the ambush method is used. With this method, the firer selects a point of aim ahead of the target and comes into the aim. Commence firing prior to the target reaching the selected point of aim and continue firing until the target is hit, goes to the ground, or the selected point of aim falls behind the target. Operational conditions may not allow the soldier to use the sights of a weapon. In this situation, the shotgun technique should be used. The soldier has both eyes open, head well up, and concentrating on the target, not on the barrel line. This technique can be effective up to 150 meters. The success a soldier experiences in hitting a moving target is based on how quick and accurate are the estimate of the range, angle, and speed of that target. These skills can only be achieved by constant practice. In the defense, fighting is normally done from a fire trench. In the attack or when patrolling, the soldier makes the best use of cover for protection from the enemy and to provide a concealed fire position. When using cover, always try to rest the forearm for more accurate shooting. If this is not possible, then rest the rifle on the cover as close to the hand as possible. Do not rest the barrel of the weapon on the cover as this will cause the shots fired to be displaced. No matter how cover is used, the four marksmanship principles must still be applied to bring effective fire on the target. When selecting a fire position, there are several factors to consider. The ideal fire position is one which allows the soldier free use of a personal weapon and grenades, provides cover from artillery and small arms fire, and also gives cover from view and enables an unobstructed view of a wide arc of fire. The trench is the basic fighting position used in the defense. To get the best position, use the right corner of the trench. Place both elbows on the elbow rest and forearm against the cover. Left-handed firers use the left corner. If the trench is shallow, kneeling, Squatting or standing with the feet apart will lower the position. If the trench is deep, standing on an ammunition box or sandbag will help. When on the move, either in the attack or on patrol, it's important for the soldier to realize that cover from view does not necessarily mean cover from fire. When firing from scrub, the squatting or kneeling position may be used for short periods. If the position is to be occupied for some time, use the sitting position which is the least tiring. Sometimes firing from the lower branches of large trees provides a better view of the arc of fire. When using low banks and folds in the ground for cover to obtain maximum protection, Muzzle clearance is kept as close to the top of the bank or the crest of the fold as possible. The shape of the ground may necessitate lying at a greater angle to the line of fire than is normal. In street fighting, 
walls and houses provide useful cover for fire positions. The use of cover will slow the tempo of battle and often allow the soldier to take deliberate aim shots. By resting the forearm whenever possible, the firing position will be more stable and the accuracy of the shooting will be increased. Bayonet fighting is a quick, instinctive skill with each situation encountered likely to demand variations in technique. Speed and vigor are more important than technical perfection, and each soldier will have to develop a style to suit their size and build. The threat or use of a bayonet in a close quarter battle situation can have a considerable effect on the enemy's morale. The first drill demonstrated is the on-guard position, which is adopted when the enemy position is approached in an assault or when about to attack the enemy with the bayonet. To adopt the on-guard position, grip the rifle firmly by the pistol grip and handguard, point the bayonet at the enemy, and adopt a natural fighting attitude. The thrust is used against a standing enemy at a distance of approximately two meters. From the on-guard position, bring the rear foot forward or jump with both feet and thrust the rifle forward, sticking the bayonet into the enemy with the whole weight of the body behind the rifle. To withdraw the bayonet, pull the rifle straight back until the bayonet is out. Resume the on-guard position and advance. If the enemy is on the ground, parry the enemy's rifle to the left or right using the boot. If practicable, stand on the weapon, thrust the rifle forward and down using the whole body weight. Be sure to keep both feet clear of the enemy. To withdraw the bayonet, pull the rifle straight back it may be necessary to stamp one foot on the enemy near the bayonet. Resume the on-guard position and advance. If a number of enemy are encountered, thrust at the nearest enemy. If the next is out of range, punch forward on guard. Advance and thrust again. If the enemy is so close that you are unable to come on guard, thrust, withdraw, and advance. When assaulting an enemy position with the bayonet, the order may be given to fire during the last few meters when the rifle is held in the on-guard position. The purpose of such firing is to keep the enemy's head down after the supporting fire has ceased or has been switched. There is a tendency to shoot high, so try to keep the muzzle slightly down when firing. Continue firing on the move until gaining the enemy position or until ordered to stop. When the enemy attacks with the bayonet, be aggressive. Make an opening and kill the enemy. If the enemy's bayonet is directed to the right of the rifle, parry the thrust by straightening the left arm vigorously, thus fending off his bayonet. Point your bayonet at the enemy. Thrust. Withdraw. Come on guard and advance. If the enemy attacks to the left, beat off the thrust to the left. Move in. Continue the swing of the rifle and strike the enemy on the head with the butt or pistol grip, knocking him to the ground. Thrust. Withdraw. Come on guard and advance. When the enemy attacks with the bayonet, be aggressive in response. If he parries your weapon to the right, release the handguard and use the left hand to either block his next move or strike at his face or throat. If feasible, follow up with a knee to his groin, regain control of the weapon, and continue. If the enemy parries your weapon to the left, strike a disabling blow to his face with the butt of the weapon and continue. Variations in technique will be developed by the individual as they become more familiar with the art of bayonet fighting. But regardless of the technique used, 
Speed and vigor in the attack are the key ingredients to success. Owing to the high speed of aircraft, it is essential that fire is delivered quickly and with reasonable accuracy. Rifle fire, collectively controlled, is an effective deterrent against low-flying aircraft. Enemy aircraft are to be engaged only when an order to do so has been given and then subject to the following conditions. The aircraft is recognizable by its markings as an enemy aircraft. The aircraft is seen to attack a ground target. And the aircraft, excluding light aircraft and helicopters, dives onto an object. Light aircraft and helicopters are excluded because friendly aircraft are liable to fly anywhere without notice and may dive suddenly in order to take evasive action. Sighting of suspected enemy light aircraft or helicopters is to be reported immediately. Aircraft over 610 meters or 2,000 feet are not to be engaged. As a rough guide to estimating height, at over 610 meters, not much more than a silhouette is visible, whereas below that height, details become distinct. Once an enemy aircraft is spotted, the command aircraft action is given. Adopt the high port position, or if applicable, hold the rifle as for the high port and adopt the kneeling position, sitting back on the right heel. Keep the upper part of the left arm parallel or higher to the ground. This will help ensure low firing, which could endanger friendly forces, does not occur. Set the sights for maximum range and move the selector lever to auto. If the aircraft is approaching head-on, the command aircraft front is given. Raise the rifle quickly into the shoulder and aim at the center of the aircraft. On the command, bursts, fire approximately 15 rounds per burst. If the safety angle cannot be maintained, stop firing and adopt the high port position. On the command, stop. Stop firing, but do not put the selector lever to S. On the command, cease firing, return to the high port position and make safe. If the aircraft is crossing, the command aircraft left or aircraft right bursts is given. Set sights for maximum range and move the selector switch to auto. Swing the rifle quickly in the same direction as the aircraft movement, passing through and beyond the aircraft until a lead of at least 216 mils or 12 degrees has been established. The spread of four fingers at arm's length is approximately 200 mils. Maintain the swing and fire a long burst. Actions on stop, cease firing, and for maintaining safety angle are the same as those taken for head-on aircraft. If the aircraft is approaching from behind, the command aircraft right, left, about is given by the section commander. Turn quickly, pivoting on the right leg in the direction named, and aim according to the flight path of the aircraft. Safety of surrounding friendly troops must always be considered. Prevent low firing by keeping the upper left arm parallel to the ground, and be aware of your surroundings when engaging crossing aircraft. Due to the high speed of today's aircraft, the soldier will have only a few seconds to deliver quick and reasonably accurate fire. Individual fire may not be a threat, but this fire, collectively controlled, can be an effective deterrent.